much. 490, revive us again. We didn't give Brother Dix too hard of a workout this morning, so we're going to give him all four verses here tonight of 490, revive us again. Stand to your feet with me if you would, please, if you're able. All four verses here tonight of number 490. trying to show me up is what he's trying to do here. I'll show you. I can do four and more than that. Thank you, Brother Dix. Doing a great job. Appreciate very much. It's funny, isn't it? You show up, you play publicly, and no one knows the hours at home spent every single day working on it, practicing. I know Shannon is practicing. Her uh, piano is in my office, so I'm aware of her practicing. <laughs> She'll just come down there and say, I need to practice a little bit. And, and it actually is no big deal. I, she's in the background and I'm working or playing Tetris and solitaire and that kind of thing. Anyhow, but I uh, appreciate so much our, our instrumentalists and the work that they put in. But I'm glad that you're here. You never know what's going to start happening as the weather changes and then the time change happens. As a pastor, I'm not sure what's going to happen, how many people are still going to show up. Even driving the bus tonight, I wasn't sure exactly who'd come and every single stop came. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. That's a blessing for sure. And so young people, we're glad that you're here. Thanks for being with us. Do me a favor tonight and focus, pay attention. The thing is, the more I have to stay Stop. It just drags out the service. It drags out the sermon. I have to start all over at the beginning every time I lose my train of thought. So do me a favor. Do yourselves a favor. Pay attention and listen. And try to sit still. Try not to stomp your feet or shuffle around or anything like that. That just distracts the folks around you. And we want to have a good service tonight. All right, let's go ahead and pray and we will begin. Father, we love you and we're grateful to be in your house tonight. We do ask your blessing on our service. Would you please speak to our heart? We enjoyed tremendously this morning and what you did. Uh, so many folks commenting and getting in touch with me. And it's good to see you at work in the hearts of your people. I pray tonight that you do exactly the same thing. Father, if anybody here tonight does not know Christ as Savior, would you please help them to let us know and then help us to show them what the Bible teaches so that they can say yes to Jesus tonight. You're a good God and we're thankful for all your blessings that you give to our lives. Help us to be aware of it and help us to be grateful. 
We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Second song, page 115. I must tell Jesus only three verses this time. Verses 1, 2, and 4 of 1, 1, 5. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, he is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make up my troubles. tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me, oh, how my heart I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Wonderful job. 156 for our final song. 156. Also, three verses. One, two, and four. Is your all on the altar? 156. sweet rest 
singing a little high there for me on that last control amen but we got through it praise the lord we're going to first john tonight first john chapter number one it's not the gospel of john this is the epistle of first john almost to the very back of your new testament first second third john jude then revelation so really your best bet is to find the book of revelation and just start backing up slowly It'll just be a few pages in front of Revelation. While you're turning there, I'm going to go grab this mic. We've got to change our uh, way of doing things. Either get me to remember to grab it, or Talon, if you guys can leave it right here instead. Either way, we'll succeed. 1 John chapter number 1. We're going to read the whole chapter tonight, and it's still only going to be a third of what we read this morning. We read 30 verses today. The 1 John chapter 1 is only 10 verses. We're going to read all of them. We preached this morning on how to get right with God. If you're not right with God, how can you get your heart right with Him? And tonight, a little bit of, of the same, but, but different how to confess your sins. This is going to be a little more practical and uh, helpful in that way. So we'll read this chapter and then we'll get right into it. First John chapter number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray together, please. Father, help us as we get to this important part of the service. I pray that you'd speak to each and every heart here. I pray that all of us would be a bit more mature than we even are. I pray we'd see the seriousness of the subject tonight and that you'd help us to grow by learning about it. Please give us knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. You are the source of all three of those things, and we come to you for it. We love you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, toward the end of Christ's ministry, he brought the disciples into a house. 
And the custom at the time was for guests who arrived at a new house to be seated and have their feet washed by a servant. The servant that did the foot washing was usually the lowest seniority servant there was, right? The new guy or the new girl. They were the ones to do the foot washing because let's be honest, no one really wants to do this, right? If I said, hey, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to put a chair up front and Charles, I'm going to have you come and sit in that chair and Charles is going to take off his shoes and his socks and then I'm going to call for Matea, his sister who loves him so much Listen to her already, moan and wail like it's going to happen. Oh, no. But I had Matea come up with a bowl of water and a towel and the warm soapy water, and her job is to wash his feet. She doesn't want to do that, do you, Matea? No, she doesn't. I'm not even sure Charles would want her to do that. No, he doesn't want her to do it either. And, uh, and so, but this is what was done. Only, you know, Charles is wearing a pair of socks and some nice dress shoes tonight. His feet are probably, and we're giving him a lot of credit here, but they're probably pretty clean. Back in this culture, it wasn't so, right? What are the folks wearing on their feet back in Bible times? Predominantly sandals and that type of footwear. Uh, how many paved roads did they have? Well, they had some. They had cobblestone roads. If you look into ancient Rome and things of that nature, there were some but uh, how many cars were driving on those roads? No. no cars. So most of them, that's a problem. Emily, would you help me? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, most of those roads are going to be dirt roads. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Emily. Uh, some of them are going to be cobblestone roads and that type of thing, but there are no cars. Now, if there were General Motors cars, we wouldn't worry about it all that much. If there were Ford cars, there'd probably be oil all over the roads, right? Isn't that right, Brother Rick? Brother Rick says, not true. <laughs> but there were animals on these roads, right? There are horses. There are donkeys. There are mules. There are oxen. There are camels. I don't know if you've ever been around animals, but they're not the cleanest creatures on the planet. In fact, if you've ever even just gone to Frankenmuth and you've seen the horse-drawn carriages, then you've probably seen evidence on the road of those horse-drawn carriages, right? When a horse has got to go, it's got to go, and it goes right on the road. It happened in Bible times the same way. Horses and donkeys and mules and camels and all of their waste all over the roads. And then here comes Charles walking down the road in his sandals. And what's getting all over Charles' feet then? Well, whatever those animals are leaving behind, right? And not just that, but the dirt and the grime. So now, Matea, Charles comes in with sandals on his feet that are covered in all sorts of residue from mules and horses and camels. It's even worse, isn't it? And so... The 12 apostles show up at this house, and there is no servant to wash their feet. And they all just sit at the table, which in their own way was them saying, well, I'm not washing anybody's feet, right? Could any one of them had said, there must not be a servant available, I'll go ahead and do it. Could any of them have done that? Yes. Could all of them have done that? Yes. Did any of them do it? No. So what happened? Jesus didn't sit down right away. And then they hear the sink turn on. That didn't happen. Uh, they see Jesus enter the room, and he has a basin and a towel. And he gets on his knees, and he approaches Peter. And he begins to wash Peter's feet. And Peter stops him because he realizes the chain of command here, right? This is the Son of God who's come to earth to die for the sins of mankind. And he's on his knees washing my feet, who was just a fisherman a couple years ago. And I'm the one in need of forgiveness that this man is going to provide when he dies for me. 
Peter knows right away. And so what does he do? He stops the Lord and he says, no, Lord, be it far from thee. And Jesus said, Peter, just leave me alone. Let me do what I need to do and I'll teach you what I'm doing. And so then Peter says, okay, well then not my feet only, but my whole body. And so then Jesus says, will you settle down? Because Peter needed to be told to settle down quite a bit. He says, look, let me explain here. As you go out and about and you're walking around the world, your feet are going to get dirty. Now, when you get saved, that's like getting a whole bath, right? Head to toe. You step in the shower and Every nook and cranny, as my wife used to tell the kids, gets washed. Winston, get in there and wash every nook and cranny. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> and so that's salvation. Salvation is the bath. Salvation is the shower. Salvation is the head to toe. But once we're saved, we don't have to get that head to toe anymore, spiritually speaking. Please take a bath. Every day. As every day is a good thing, sometimes twice. Uh, he says, you don't need that head to toe, but you need your feet washed. And what was the lesson that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples here? Well, number one, humility. One of those guys should have done it instead of leaving it for the Lord to do. But number two, he was teaching them about the importance of daily forgiveness. So here's what happened. 6,000 years ago, two people named Adam and Eve were placed into the Garden of Eden. And God gave them one rule. They had one job, and that was to not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, every tree in this garden, you can eat from them. Eat them all several times a day. Mix it up. I don't care what you do, but there's one tree I don't want you eating from, and that's this one. And Adam said, okay, no problem. And Eve said, okay, won't do it. Until one day the serpent shows up, and she, she, he tempts her to eat from the tree, and she does eat. Then she gives to her husband, and he eats. And they disobeyed God. God said, don't do it. They did it anyway. That's disobedience, right? When we disobey God, it's called sin. When God says, here's the line, don't cross it, and we cross it anyway, that's sin. When God says, don't do it, and we do it anyways, that's sin. When God says, do it, and we don't do it, that's sin. Anytime we disobey God, it's sin. Now, I was born a sinner. My mother will probably tell you differently. It's my brother who's really the sinner, and I'm the angel, right? Now, I was born a sinner because when dogs have babies, they're called puppies, and when cats have babies, they're called kittens, and when sinners have babies, what are they? Sinners. sinners. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Everything bears fruit after his kind. Never in the history of man has a dog been giving birth to a litter of puppies and then out come a kitten too. It doesn't work that way. Nor has a cat ever been delivering a litter of kittens and a puppy come out. Cats have kittens and dogs have uh, puppies and sinners have other sinners. Because Adam and Eve sinned, and ultimately they're all of our great, 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 great grandparents, we're all sinners too. We were born with that sin nature. That's why Jesus told a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3, ye must be born again. There are three parts to every human being. There is the body, that is that handsome, magnificent, physical specimen you see in front of you tonight. There is our soul. That's our intellect. That's what you and I are using to communicate right now. But then we have a part of us called our spirit. And our spirit is that part of us that communicates with God. Now the problem is, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit, he told them that in the day ye eat thereof, 
ye shall surely die. Now let me ask you, in the day they ate, did their body die? No. The day they ate, did their soul die? No. But their spirit did. That part that communicated with the Lord, their spirit died. So what happens? They had to be born again. We look back on when Jesus died. They looked forward to when he was going to die. And so, when you and I are born, we, we're born with a living body. And we're born with a living soul. But we're born with a dead spirit. And that spirit has to be born again. How does a person get born again? We use some of these terms, and they all mean the same thing. Saved, born again, salvation. What does that mean? It means that God forgives us of all of our sins. Every sin that we have ever committed and will ever commit, God forgives us of those sins. I was 15 years old. I was growing up on the east side over there. I went to Flint Academy to school up on McClellan Avenue. Me and Dan Bard, angels. Right? Never any trouble whatsoever. And uh, somebody uh, started talking to me about church and God and Jesus. And it started getting me thinking. And I opened an old Bible that I had that I used to take on the church bus with me. I used to ride the bus to church. And I found inside of it a little gospel track. And I read through the track, just like our blue tracks over there on the wall. And that track told me four things. It told me that I was a sinner told me that I disobeyed God. It told me that there's a penalty or a punishment on sin. Because anytime you do something wrong, there's a penalty. If you speed down Fenton Road 70 miles an hour and there's a policeman there, he's going to pull you over and give you a ticket because the speed limit's 45. I don't know that from experience. Amen. Uh, I know other highways from experience, but not this one. <clears throat> there's a penalty. Whenever you do wrong, when I was a kid, my parents had rules. Now, if I broke those rules... I had to pay a penalty. And God says there's a penalty on sin. And that penalty is death. Physical death, your body's going to die someday. Spiritual death, your soul will die eternally in hell. That's horrifying. Many people don't believe in hell anymore. But it's still in the Bible. See, just because you don't believe in it doesn't mean it's true or not. Right now, half the country thinks that there was election fraud going on, and the other half thinks that no fraud went on whatsoever. One of them's right, and the other is wrong. And so you can be genuinely wrong. One time, I was heading to Atlanta, Georgia, and I take Irish Road up to I-69, get on the highway, heading west on I-69, and I kept on going, and I got to the 75 interchange. But I didn't take the ramp to 75 South, which would eventually become US 23, and head due south all the way down to Atlanta, Georgia. I kept going on I-69. Where was I headed? Atlanta. Where was I going? Chicago. Huh? And I was sincere. But I was wrong. And you can be sincere and wrong. You've got to find out what this book teaches, and what this book says is truth. You can't go on your own personal experience. There's enough experiences as there are people in the globe, seven billion of us. That's unreliable. Look at the opinions just about everyday things. We can't agree on anything. Number of people in this room wouldn't agree on everything. You can't go on experience. Don't trust other men like priests, ministers, rabbi, preachers, pastors. You say, you? Yeah, don't take my word for anything. I'm unreliable, man. As long as I'm reading and teaching and preaching from this book, you can trust what I say. But as soon as I say, in my opinion, mine's no worth no more than yours is. You can't trust a church or a denomination. Oh, the Baptists or the Catholics or the Presbyterian. You can't trust them. You've got to go to the Word of God. 
and see what it says. And here's what it says. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know a lot of Greek, but I do know some Greek. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to wow you tonight. I'm going to dazzle you. When the Bible says, for all have sinned, if you look up that word all in the Greek, do you know what it means? All. Aren't you impressed? All. So if we said all the people in this room, who would we leave out? No one. So when God says all have sinned, who is left out? No one. I'm a sinner. My wife is a sinner. Notice how I said that different. My children are sinners. Ashton's running the sound. He's a sinner. Brent Dick's a sinner who plays the piano. Dan Bard's a sinner who drives a bus. Russ Cronk is a sinner who teaches a Sunday school class. But we're all sinners. We've sinned against God. We've disobeyed Him. Because of that, there's a penalty on that sin. Our body's going to die, and then our soul will die and burn forever in hell. It's horrifying to consider. When I was 15 and I heard that, I thought, what do I have to do to avoid going to hell? I wanted to know. And it kept on going, and it said that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, was placed in her womb by the Holy Spirit. And so God was his Father. So when your Father is sinless, you're sinless too. The sinlessness came from the Father and the mortality, the body, came from the mother. Jesus never did sin. He's the Son of God. He's incapable of sin. And so they took him and they beat him and they mocked him and they stripped him naked and they took a cross, kind of like that one. It was laid down on the ground, and the, body, or the Bible says that he was beaten so much that his face didn't even look like a human face. Mind you, he did nothing wrong. The Roman ruler Pilate said, I find no fault in him. The Jewish council, they were allowed to release one prisoner because of the Passover week, and Jesus was being tried with another man who was a robber and a murderer named Barabbas. And so they said, we can release one of these two, kind of hinting at Jesus because he did nothing wrong. And the crowd shouted, give us Barabbas. And they let Barabbas go and they nailed Jesus to a cross. A soldier held his arm to the cross while another held a spike, like a railroad spike, on his arm and nailed that spike through his arm and into the wood of that cross. They did the same to the other arm. And they did the same to his feet. And he never did anything wrong. He never did anything to deserve this. And there was a hole there beside that cross, and they got on each side of it and two soldiers together lifted him up on that cross and that cross started to slide down into that hole until they got him perfectly upright and then it just fell. Can you imagine being nailed to that thing and then hitting the thud on the bottom and feeling it pull? The Bible says every bone he had was out of joint. My shoulders will go out of joint if I'm not careful. I was playing volleyball, tried to spike the volleyball, threw my shoulder out of sight. It's crazy. And I'll tell you what, I've never felt pain like a bone out of joint. Both of them will go out. Jesus had every bone out of joint. Every one. I can't even, even wrap my head around that. They spit on him. They mocked him. They said, if you're the king of the Jews, come on down off of that cross. And you know what? He could have but he didn't. Why didn't he? Because he was dying for a purpose. What was that purpose? Your sins. My sins. 
In fact, while he was hanging on that cross, the Bible says the sky grew dark like the middle of the night. There's a veil in the temple that separates the inner court from the Holy of Holies. It's nine inches thick, and that veil was torn in two. Imagine if you put three phone books together and then ripped them in half. That's what it was like when the veil was torn. Jesus had nine phrases as he hung on that cross, and the last one was this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Every other time in the scripture, Jesus refers to God as Father. Even the night before as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me. But as he hangs on the cross and the sky is dark, he cries out, my God. What's the difference when someone has sin on them that is unforgiven? God is not their Father. He is only their God. Sometimes people misspeak and they say, "God, we are all God's children. And you know what? That's not true. We're all God's creation, but you're only God's child if you've come to Christ seeking forgiveness and salvation. You can't pray, Heavenly Father. He's not your Father. He can be. That's the next thing. Okay, preacher, so I'm a sinner and I deserve to go to hell, but Jesus died on the cross and paid for all my sins. So how do I get forgiven? How, how do I find salvation? How do I get saved? How do I get born again? It's really easy. Now, it wasn't easy for Christ. He did the hard part. Our part's easy. It's trust. It's acceptance. Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. So what does that mean? It's really simple. Do you believe that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago was born the Son of God? Do you believe that he was sinlessly perfect but that he took your sin upon himself when he died on that cross and then three days and three nights later he rose from the grave bodily? Do you believe that? If you say, yes, I believe that, that's the first part. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Saved from your sins. Saved to heaven. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, that means when you, with your heart, believe what Jesus did for you, you'll find yourself with his righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's break it down. Whosoever, what does that mean? Anybody. It means handsome ugly. It means skinny. Not so skinny. It means wealthy. And it means broke. It means black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and anything else you can fit in there. God is no respecter of persons. Jesus died for every man and every woman. Doesn't matter what nationality, what ethnicity, None of it matters. Whosoever, whosoever what? Shall call upon the name of the Lord. That's that mouth part, right? With a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Call upon the Lord. How do you call upon the Lord? You pray. You ask. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not maybe. Not God will think about it. Not will put you on the list. Shall be saved. It's pretty good. So there's no reason why anyone in this room can't find their home in heaven someday. Because you don't get there based on how good you are. You don't get there on, on how good a Christian you are or how often you go to church or how much of the Bible you know. You go to heaven because of what Jesus did for you. 
there's a story of a old circus performer named Charles Blondin. And one of the things that he used to do way back in the 1800s, he would stretch a tightrope across a section of Niagara Falls. And he would get out there and he would walk across that tightrope. Crowds would gather, and he'd, he'd take money from them, uh, and he would walk across that tightrope. He would take one of those balancing poles, you know, and he'd get out there, and he'd walk all the way across it, and he'd walk back. Then once he got so good at it, he'd start doing unusual things. They say that he pushed a, a little stove out there one day and actually cooked breakfast, standing on a tightrope over top of Niagara Falls. Then one day, he took a wheelbarrow out there, and he asked the crowd, do you think I can push this wheelbarrow across the tightrope? And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, you can do it. And he pushed the wheelbarrow all the way down one side, and then he figured out a way to get around it, and he pushed it all the way back. And then he asked the crowd, do you think that I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and push him across the tightrope? And everybody was cheering, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Do it, do it. And he walked up to a guy, and he said, sir, do you think I could push a man across a tightrope in this wheelbarrow? And the guy said, I know you could. I know you could. He said, then get in the wheelbarrow. That's the test of faith. See, you can sit here tonight and say, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe that, it, that if I put my faith in him, that he could save me and take me to heaven. Then do it. In a few minutes, Brother Dix will play the piano and... Many folks are going to come forward and they're going to kneel at the altar to pray. And if you're here tonight and you've never put your faith in Christ, come on down, get my attention. I'll have somebody take the Bible who's an expert in the subject and show you exactly what you need to know in order to be saved and put your faith in Christ. Get in the wheelbarrow. If you don't, your sins won't be forgiven. If you don't, you will die and go to hell. If you're sitting here tonight saying, I got time, you don't know that. You know, you're trying to scare me. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to be realistic. Ask my wife how old her sister was when she was killed. She'll tell you 13. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. People keep telling me, hey, I heard somebody died of coronavirus. Oh, is that right? And I always say, how old were they? Because I'm 48. And then they tell me, ah, 46. And I go, you did that on purpose, didn't you? Huh? And I'm not saying you're going to die of coronavirus. Don't get me wrong. What I am saying is you don't know how long you have. Listen to a testimony of a lady today whose four-year-old daughter was at a birthday party, running around the house playing. And then she woke up in the middle of the night. She was crying. Her legs hurt. They couldn't do anything for her. She was massaging her legs, putting heat on them, putting ice on them. Nothing helped. Went to the emergency room. They ran all kinds of tests. Finally, a cancer doctor came in and said, your daughter has leukemia. She's four years old. They sent her to St. Jude's Children's Hospital, and they worked with her for two years. But she died at six. You don't know how long you have. So my advice to you is don't wait. You just don't know. Most people, on the day they die, didn't wake up thinking, this is it. It's just reality. Most people. Now, some of them do. They tell me Alex Trebek just last week, host of Jeopardy knew that that was going to be his last day. And he and his wife just sat on their deck and talked and reminisced. And he passed that night. Sometimes you know. 99% of the time you don't know. Somebody will die today that didn't wake up this morning thinking, this is my last day on earth. So what do you do? You get saved now. Behold, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. So that's the head to toe. That's the bath. That's the shower. So what's the feet? The feet is just kicking around the world. 
as you're going about your day-to-day life as a Christian, after you've been washed head to toe, your feet are going to get dirty. You're going to sin. You're going to slip up and say something you shouldn't say. You're going to slip up and think something you shouldn't think. You're going to do something you shouldn't do, and you're going to sin. Hopefully it's not absolutely life-altering. There are those sins too. Hopefully you're smart enough to avoid those sins. But you have a sin nature that didn't go away when you got saved. You got a new nature that was added to the old nature. So now those natures get to fight each other. And every day, you're offered several times a day choices. Someone says something to you that makes you mad. And you say, I can do one of two things. I can either love my enemy like the Lord Jesus told me to, or man, I can let this guy have it, which he full on deserves. And you've got to make that choice. Sometimes you're going to make the wrong choice. You're going to let a guy have it. There is a reason we don't have, you know, I love my church, Lighthouse Baptist Church bumper stickers around here. Because you'd expect me to put one on my car. And I probably should not have a bumper sticker on my car that refers to this church. It may bring a bad testimony on this church. I am not the most courteous driver. Most people drive a little too slow for me. I am subject to the powers that are over me, and I pay every ticket I get. That's how I'm subject to them. But I don't always obey that speed limit. I'm confessing some sin right now. Uh, And so I don't put that bumper sticker on my car. And you know what? You have moments, you have days where you blow it. And what has to happen? You need your feet washed. Let's get to the text, and we're going to be done here tonight. First John, I don't have time to go through the whole thing like I'd like. Well, let's go to verse number 7. Let's go to verse 6. 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you all, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So God is light, zero darkness. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Cardi B's new song glorifies God? Yeah, if you say who, you're, I'm not, you're not the one I'm talking to right now. I'm talking to these, maybe these. You think Cardi B... This new song glorifies God. No. So would you call it light or darkness? Darkness. And so if you say you have fellowship with God but walk in darkness, you lie. You know what? You need your feet washed. You need to confess that sin. We continue. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So when you're walking in darkness, you are out of fellowship with God. That's like saying, you know, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to get drunk and pray. Those two things don't go together, do they? I'm going to get high and read my Bible. Those things don't go together. I'm going to think about how much I love my wife while I'm on a date with another woman. These things don't go together, right? And God says, look, you can't walk in sin. You can't live a life of sin and walk in darkness and think that we're going to have a good relationship. You've got to confess that sin. And you've got to keep your heart clean. Verse number 8. This is for those of us in denial. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You'd be surprised how many times I'm counseling with someone who lives a very carnal life, and they'll say, I do my best, and I'll think to myself, I'd hate to see you at your worst, because your best is terrible. It's like you're not even trying. It's sad. We lie to ourselves. 
We justify our sin. Verse 9, the good news here, but if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Man, that's good. First off, if we confess, this is a conditional promise. If you don't confess, you don't get the forgiveness. If you don't take your sandals off and let Jesus take the towel and wash you, you still have dirty feet and you have no fellowship. Because he says, as long as you want to live that way, I'm not interested in walking with you. Huh? And so, he, if we confess, what does confess mean? It means to agree with. If God says, thou shalt not lie, then we agree with him. It is a sin to lie. And then if we tell a lie, then we go to God and say, God, you said that lying is sin, and I just told a lie, so I'm coming to tell you I've sinned. I confess. I agree with you that I did wrong. That's the first part to forgiveness. It's also, gentlemen, the first key to a happy marriage. Just tell her, you're right, I'm wrong. That's what you got to do, man. It's a joke. Although you guys might want to write that down. Uh, it may come in handy. Maybe I'm sorry. Anyway. Uh, confess our sin. He is what? Faithful. Man, God is faithful. See, God always does what he says we, he will do. We don't always do what we say we're going to do, but he does. And so he says if we confess our sins, he will be faithful to forgive us our sins. If we will sit down in the chair and take off the sandals, he will wash our feet. Because what is taking off the sandals? It's admitting you have dirty feet and that you need them washed. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. There's justice at play here. How do you balance the equation? You confess, he forgives. To con faithful just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, what's that next word? All. What's it mean in the Greek? All. Greek scholars, every one of us. You confess your sins, God will forgive you from all your sins. You don't confess you don't get the forgiveness. If you walk in darkness and you choose to not confess, you're not forgiven. And I don't mean forgiven in, in, in terms of salvation. I mean forgiven in your conscience. Because you know when you've sinned against God. Just like when my kids were little and they did something wrong that their mother told them not to do or that I told them not to do. They were like Adam in the garden. You know, God comes to the garden. He's like, Adam, where are you? Where was he? He was hiding. Why was he hiding? Because he realized that he was naked. Who told him he was naked? Well, he ate of the fruit. He lost his innocence. One time, uh, Winston had a Game Boy, and he was playing with his Game Boy, and he got too rough with it or something, and he broke the Game Boy. And so he went out to our barn, and he hid Game Boy in our barn. And I was out in the barn, and I find this Game Boy. And I come walking, and Winston sees that Game Boy in my hand. He takes off running. <laughs> What's he running from? He's running from me. Why? Because he knew I found him out. And you know what? As long as he's running, we can't have a relationship. And as long as you're running from God, you have no relationship with him. The only way to have a relationship is to stop running and to look him in the eye and say, God, you're right and I'm wrong. You're holy and I've sinned. And I confess that I've sinned against you and I'm seeking your forgiveness. And you know what that does? It restores the fellowship. Your conscience needs that. Because although every sin you've ever committed has already been paid for and it's under the blood of Jesus Christ, you know when you've done wrong. and You know when you've sinned against God. And you need that off your record for your own state of mind. 
for the own, your own peace of heart. You confess it and get it right. Let me get to the notes. I haven't read a single note yet. Number one, admit your guilt. The Bible is true and you are not. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. Number two, don't hide your sin. God brought the children of Israel across the Jordan River and they had some battles to fight, being led by Joshua. The first city they went to was a city called Jericho. Remember the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and all that? God had told the Israelites, defeat Jericho, take no spoils from Jericho. The first of everything is God's. Jericho was the first city. It belonged to God. He told the people, take nothing. Well, there was a guy named Achan who decided he was above the rules. He stole three things. He stole some gold, he stole some silver, and he stole a Babylonian garment. It must have been some garment. He takes those things and he gets them home. He busts in the door and his wife says, what do you have there? Shh, I took this from Jericho. And so they pulled the rug back and they dug a hole and they buried it and they covered it back up and pulled the rug back over. The next city they were to fight was a city called Ai. Ai was a tiny little city. The children of Israel should have defeated them easily. But they didn't. God caused them to lose. And God went to Joshua and he said, Joshua, there is sin in the camp. So Joshua started going tent to tent. God said somebody took something from Jericho. They get to Achan's tent and they go in. They pull the rug back. They dig the dirt out. And there's the gold, the silver, and the garment. And they took Achan out and they stoned him to death. That means they picked up big heavy stones and threw them at him until enough of them hit him, killed him, and they died. He died. They did the same thing to his wife. They did the same thing to his children. Then they took their bodies and they put them in a pile and burned them. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? You say, why did his children die? They were in on it. It's called being an accomplice. You know, if your buddies robbed the gas station and you're in the car with them, even if you didn't drive or go in, you go to jail. It's kind of important to pick the right friends, isn't it? By the way, everybody in prison didn't do it. I didn't do it. I had an uncle who, was, who drove the getaway car. I didn't know I was the getaway car. Yeah, he still did his time, even though he didn't do it. Don't hide your sin. The Bible says, be sure your sin will what? Find you out. Number three, confess your sin. To confess means agree. Number four, trust that God will forgive after we've confessed and sought forgiveness. God doesn't hold grudges. Here's what he says, I will remember your sin no more. Here's the thing about God. God's omniscient. We talked about it in Sunday school tonight. What does that mean? All knowing. God doesn't say this. He doesn't say, I will forget your sin. He can't. He's God. But what does he do? I will remember it no more. That means I choose to not remember pretty good, isn't it? Number five, he will forgive as often as we seek it. Last story and I'm done. Peter came to Jesus and I think Peter was being a little self-righteous, meaning he was proud of himself and how, how holy he was. And he said, Jesus, you know, I've been thinking about forgiveness and it kind of dawned on me that if somebody for, sins against me, that I should forgive them. And that's kind of like, duh, right? I don't think Jesus said duh, but it's kind of a duh moment. Yeah, you should forgive them if they sin against you. And then Peter said this, in fact, I've been thinking, I think I ought to forgive a guy seven times. And Jesus just said this, 70 times seven, which, if you really want to do the math, is 490 times, right? Right? But Jesus didn't mean that forgive someone 490 times. Then on that 491st, you don't have to. What he's saying is 
you never stop forgiving someone. But it's not just someone sins against you and you, you, you don't stop forgiving. It's when they do the same thing to you. The same day. That almost seems impossible, doesn't it? How could someone sin against you in the same way 490 times in the same day? Some of you wives are like, oh, I got a husband like that. (laughs) What's the point? The point is you always offer forgiveness no matter who it is, what they've done, how often they've done it. You just forgive. And here's the thing. God doesn't ask anything of us that he doesn't already do himself. So you know what that means? Just as God's told you to forgive whoever does it however many times, he'll do the same. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten on my face and said, God, I did it again. I did it again. And I just told you three days ago I'd not do it again. And I asked your help, and here I am. I did it again. Forgive me. And God says, I'm glad you came to me. Because you came, I can forgive you. And I do, because I'm faithful and just. I cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Isn't that good? There's a man named Ford Porter. He wrote a tract called God's Simple Plan of Salvation. Some of you old-timers may have run across that before. It's that one that it's gray on the bottom and it fades up into pink on the front. And when you open it up, you go, that's way too much to read. But he wrote that track, and no doubt millions of people have been saved because of that track. But Ford Porter had a habit. when, As soon as he realized he sinned against God, he'd confess that sin right then, wherever he was. One preacher said we were walking across the street, I think in Cleveland, Ohio, and Ford Porter just stood like at attention, like something just popped into his mind. He said in the crosswalk, in the middle of the street as we were crossing, he got on a knee and began to pray. He said, I'm watching the, the thing at the end flash red, like, you know, don't walk, get across here. And finally, he gets up, and we get across the street before the traffic starts coming. And he said, what did you do? Why did you stop and pray in the crosswalk? He said, I remembered that I sinned against God, and I had to take care of it right then. Well, wouldn't it be good to be that sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Let's stand to our feet, please. Brother Dixon's coming to the piano. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let me ask you tonight, do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven? Or would you have some doubt about it? If you're not sure, as soon as he starts playing, there'll be others. You'll not be alone, I promise, that start moving forward. You come up. Get my attention. We'll have somebody take the Bible. We're not going to make a spectacle out of it. Nobody's even going to know. But they'll pull you aside and sit down with you and show you from the Bible what you need to know. If you're here tonight and God's reminded you of sin that's on your heart, you need your feet washed. Now's a wonderful time to take care of that. Maybe you need to come and tell God that you need your feet washed more often than you've been coming to Him. Why don't you come make it right tonight? Father, bless our invitation, please. In Christ's name, amen. The piano plays, the altar is open. You come. Never hesitate or wait. Move on that first note. Do business with the Lord. If you're here tonight, you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. You come. Let us show you from the Bible what you need to know. Take your time. We're in no hurry tonight. Just do business with the Lord.
thank you for your attention tonight. You may be seated. Uh, ushers, would you come forward, please? Brother Talon. Oh, I'm sorry, Russ. I didn't see you coming, brother. I'm sorry. All right. Hey, uh, last week we we barely missed budget. I can't even believe it. It's it's funny. It's so close. Seventeen dollars and ninety one cents. We missed budget. Uh, so praise the Lord. Thank you. Honestly, that's as good as hitting it in my book. But we still didn't give ourselves credit for it. Brother Russ, would you please pray for the offering? Let me give you some announcements. We'll have you out of here. Ladies, thank you. Night and day from last week. And I can't tell you how much that means to me. I'm very proud of you and I appreciate your behavior tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, here we go. Prayer emphasis. Pray for the health of our church family, please. We do have one, two, uh, three folks that have coronavirus right now. They're at home. They're quarantining. Uh, they're not coming around, and we're not going around them. And then we have a couple that just have colds and seasonal allergy stuff like that. We're just praying that uh, everybody will stay healthy and uh, happy. We've got hand sanitizer over here. We have gloves over here. We're going to purchase some masks and have them over here. If you'd like to wear these things, please do. Please don't make anyone feel like you shouldn't or you don't have to. Do what is best for you, what makes you feel safest and most comfortable and, and so forth, okay? Uh, we're not going to play that around here. If you don't want to wear one, that's fine. You don't have to wear one either. Just don't go around spitting on people, right? I'm the only one that doesn't need spitting around here, and it, usually it stays to about a six-foot radius from this pulpit, and, uh, and I leave it there. I don't mean I go around spitting on people. What kind of person do you think I am? Anyhow, uh, but, but uh, those things are there. Pray for the health of our church family. Okay, Bible reading. Beginners, you're reading Psalms 86 to 110. And then our quiz will be on 100 to 125 on Wednesday night. So 86 to 110 for beginners, Psalms. Advanced, read all of Malachi, all of Matthew, all of Mark. Those are your 50 chapters for the week. Wednesday night, importance of the local church will continue on. Thursday night, soul winning visitation, 7 p.m. Hope you'll come. Salvations, we're at 165 for a year to date, 29 baptized. And then Thanksgiving Sunday is a week from today. Going to have a great time. We'll take some testimonies that day and just focus on gratitude and thanking the Lord for his goodness. We'll also receive a Thanksgiving offering in both services that day. It's an offering that we can bring to God over and above our regular tithes and offerings. It's a biblical offering. The Israelites had this special offering set aside as part of their year as well, and they just brought to God out of their abundance and out of their means. And I hope you'll uh, consider doing the same thing for the Lord. Then, ladies conference, you ladies that are interested in going, sign up on the clipboard over here, please. I, I, I need to clarify a little bit. The conference costs $25. The hotel room costs $25 per lady. That's $50. That's what you turn into us. 
then usually you eat before you head down there and then you chip in a little bit for gas so that's that other twenty five dollars you don't have to give that to us you pay that when you go to the restaurant and then you give a few dollars to your ride so you turn in fifty but you probably want to count on seventy five in total for those other things all right adult christmas party saturday december the twelfth happy birthday jesus december the twentieth that's the uh, sunday before christmas we'll have all of our Young kids come up and they'll sing for us and we'll have a good time with all that. All right, I better get you out of here because the junior church teachers are looking at their watches. I think they're lighting their torches and sharpening their pitchforks as we speak. They get mad when I go long and uh, we got to get you out of here. Let's stand up. We'll pray and be dismissed. Hey, be safe driving home. It's probably windy and blustery and maybe even rainy out there. Bus drivers, hey, thank you for getting here on time today and everybody was good and early. The kids had plenty of time to get to their classes. Drive safely on the way home. Take your time. We're in no rush. Amen. Father, bless us, please, as we head on out after another wonderful Lord's Day in your house. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the clear teaching of the Word of God. Help us to stay right with you and to keep our sins confessed on a daily basis. Help us to walk in the light as you are in the light and let us not deceive ourselves. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. See you later.